Hey there, sports psych enthusiasts. I'm Dr. Colin Fair, and I want to share my passion with you. I love talking about ways to unleash the power of the mind. This recording is part of a larger lecture series I've created in an effort to make sports psychology concepts more accessible to a larger audience. The information contained in this series is especially well suited for students of sports psychology and is presented in a way that makes for easy listening for all. Welcome to Sports Psych Concepts. All right, everybody, welcome to the Sports Psych Concepts lecture series. This next presentation will go over elements of peak performance and the more common way that you probably think about this is when athletes are in the zone, like they achieve that peak, they, uh, they do something special, they go unconscious, all the different ways that we describe this. That's what I'm talking about today and, and want to cover some of the more specific elements of that. So we'll touch on peak performance descriptors. A lot of that you will be familiar with. We'll talk about this flow idea, which is related, but not always, not always exactly the same, doesn't always occur at the same time someone's in the zone or has a peak performance, but something to be sought on it on its own and so we'll touch on that this this individual zones of optimal functioning or the eyes off model is something it's a useful way to try and understand individual differences between athletes on how to achieve the zone or when they achieve that zone I'll share with you something that's never been shared before and that's sort of my own uh, untested theory on this is just a sort of speculative way for for you to think about this that that um who knows there might be something to it or or not it's just kind of an interesting idea related to this and th that's unique to me and then we'll look at characteristics of top performers of co of, of course uh, always helpful to look at the things that they do because we want to try and emulate that and then share some pro tips how do we get into that optimal state to achieve per peak performance more more uh frequently or more regularly so those are the key topics let's let's get going into them right away so peak performance descriptors is the first thing that we've got to touch on here so when we think of a peak performance right it's when athletes they're they're completely immersed in what it is that they're doing okay so they have this so mindfulness is wrapped into this idea as well there's this mindful focus on the present. the the past the future is really irrelevant everything that is is within the athlete's mind is completely what it need what needs to be there okay there's not these irrelevant or other distracting stimuli that are there and athletes generally when they achieve this state they feel like they're in they're in control over what's happening but they're also in control over their thoughts and their feelings or emotions the energy and and all of that comes together at the same time it's like this this crazy sort of paradoxical feeling of like man i'm like completely in the control but i don't really feel like i'm trying to be in control we'll touch on that again a little bit in a moment but it's usually very very fun it's enjoyable it's exciting when it happens doesn't happen that often it's characterized by high self-confidence high energy right there's a lot of different things and another term that you probably heard relative to this is like going unconscious right it's like you have the conscious mind we have this awareness of all these things and then you go unconscious and it's like I, everything was just happening and I was aware of it, like I was observing it happening and happening and experiencing it, and I was doing it, but it was almost like it was unconscious. Pretty, pretty, pretty cool. And and those of you who have experienced this know what that's like. There's also normally this time distortion element, like either things speed up or they slow down, right? Some things uh, uh, change there temporally many times you you see it as like it's slow motion like the ball was coming and i could see see the spin on the ball or the lettering on the ball or or the seams in the ball or whatever right because it was all everything was slowed down you're able to see more detail than maybe you would in real time slow motion amazing 
and and sometimes athletes describe it as like I don't know, just everything just came together. It just all fell into place. Where normally when we go out and we perform on an average day, like some things are clicking, but then there's one or two pieces that just weren't quite there. But when we have those peak performance days, everything's clicking. Everything was on. And and so we describe that as like it was it was just easy. Like I didn't really have to try that hard. It's this effortless effort sort of thing. Like, yeah, you're putting forth effort, obviously, but it's it's like it was easy. Pretty powerful. And and there's almost like this athletes describe they have these premonitions like I could see what was going to happen before it happened I knew where the play was going to move to before it was even there it's like I knew it before I even before I even saw it, before it happened I knew something before I even learned something right sometimes there you can have a peak performance Peak performance is basically in learning situations. Like, I don't know how I know this, but I know that that's true. Like, I knew it before you even told it to me. And so it can extend beyond the sporting realm. Or another descriptor is it was just automatic, right? It was automatic. Everything just happened. Boom. I was in cruise control. It was just going. And then lastly, there's this, this at least of what I'm going to share. Obviously, you might know some other descriptors for this, but there's this relaxed intensity. So so it seems like that's a contradiction, right? How can you have a certain level of intensity, but then you're relaxed? And so again, that goes with this like easy effort. So it's like, how does that make sense? You're putting forth effort, but it's easy. So this relaxed intensity. So you have the intensity there, but it's it's you're not you're not trying so hard that you have tension right to where your muscles are kind of battling each other and you have this sort of grimace on your face it's just like relaxed and it's easy effort but it's also intense so these are some of the more common descriptors like i said you may know of some others so add them to the list that's one of the cool things about this is anybody who's who has experienced a peak performance kind of puts their own stamp on it in terms of how they would describe it so let's segue away now from this peak performance idea or being in the zone where you're actually, the, the performance itself is at the highest possible level that it could be and talk about this flow. So this was develop, developed by a researcher named Mahali Csikszentmihalyi and there's different, you'll hear people pronounce his name differently out there, but it's defined as the state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. Okay, so this, this that of course can overlap with a peak performance, but not, not necessarily, okay? So they, they, they can co-occur, but there's um, nine primary characteristics of this that, that we'll go over to maybe kind of distinguish this from a peak performance, okay? So the, the first one is where action and awareness merge okay so it's like you're aware of everything that's happening and and you're you're also doing what it is that you're doing right you're you have that awareness of what you're doing and then it's all just it all just comes together it's like you're seeing it happen experiencing it while you're doing it so you're you're in a sense it's just like you're you you become the action that you are doing that that's kind of an interesting way to put it. It's like become, if you're a runner, it's like you need to become what it is you're doing, become running itself. And that's characteristic of a flow state, okay? So we also need to have very clearly defined goals. Okay, this isn't gonna happen if we're just kind of out there willy nilly and it's just, well, I'm just going with it, right? You're not gonna find a flow state if you're going with it. You have to, because the focus has to be high enough and the only way the focus is going to be high enough is if you have a very clearly defined goal that you're striving for to direct that focus in essence. Okay. So <clears throat> we also need to have clear and specific feedback with this, right? So, so um, the information that we're getting back, which it could be from coaches or teammates or a, a parent or a sports site consultant, whoever, but it needs to be very clear and specific to what it is we're doing. So again, we can direct our attention on the things that matter most. And with that, it'll help 
instill or facilitate this total concentration. Okay, we have that clearly defined goal, we have that clear and specific feedback, and so we have the things that we need to, to have that heightened sense of concentration to where we're, and, and, and concentration again, different from you know just merely focus or attention where it's maintained focus, right? So we have that total concentration because we have all these clear things that we're striving for that we're able to sustain that. And then there's this paradox of control, which I kind of alluded to previously, right? With, with peak performance. So in the flow state, it's like you have the sense of being in control without trying to be in control. So it was like, man, that's the dream. We all are kind of a little bit of control freaks who want to control things, but then we try really hard to control things. We realize we can't control things. So when you find a flow state, how a lot of people describe that is it's like, well, I'm in control, but I'm not really trying that hard to be in control. It's like, it's just happening, right? And so there's this paradox idea where it's like in really in order to be in control, you have to give up control. So you have to let it happen somewhat, right? Instead of making it happen, right? You can't make the flow state happen. You have to get out of your way and let it happen is kind of the idea with this. So I already mentioned you, the action and awareness merge. So you become this oneness with the activity where again, in the definition, that's the only thing that, that matters. So really it's like we're, we, we become interested in the activity for its own sake. Okay, so it's not for some future benefit or some external purpose. It's just like the, the doing of the activity itself. We become, we have that oneness of experience with what it is we're doing. And then that is intrinsically enjoyable. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Next is that time distortion piece. So again, you see the overlap with, with peak performance. That is there for sure. And then lastly, it's it's an experience to, that we should enjoy and appreciate just by itself, right? So it's, it's what's des described as an autotelic experience where we're doing something where itself, the doing of it is the reward, okay? So it's not just a means to an end, like doing it is the actual reward itself. So these are the, these are the kind of the main nine characteristics of this. So then you can see it's like, well, I could have a flow experience and it not be a peak performance. So for example, if I'm a cross country runner, I could be out there and I could be totally one with what it is I'm doing and I'm immersed and I have this time distortion and everything comes together, action and awareness merge as I'm running the race. But I just didn't quite have it physically. I didn't have my peak performance that day physically. So it's like mentally I was able to achieve that flow state and experience that. And it was like, man, this was cool. I got that runner's high during the race and carried after the race. Amazing. But I didn't even run my best race. I mean, that was crazy. So it's possible to achieve this. So that's why I mentioned up front, we need to distinguish this from a peak performance because it is a little bit different, okay? And so there's this orthogonal model of flow that Stavro and colleagues came out with. And essentially you have these two dimensions. So one dimension would be the skill dimension. You have high skill or low skill, depending on whatever the particular activity is. And then there's this challenge element, okay? So flow tends to occur when the challenge is high, but our skill level is also high, right? So we have the skill the high level of skill to meet the high level of challenge. Okay, if we have a situation where our skill level is low, but the challenge is high, like, oh man, I don't know if I can meet up to this challenge. I don't know if my skills are there. That's when we get anxiety, right? That's a different experience where I don't really know. And that ties into stress, right? Stress is when I don't know if I can meet the demands of the environment or the situation that's placed on me. So I experience anxiety, okay? So then if we, we have low skill matched up against low challenge, then we're just not really interested in what it is we're doing, right? It's like, okay, well, I'm just kind of apathetic because there's not really anything going. I don't have any skill and there's not really a challenge. So there's nothing that's drawing me into this. I'm apathetic toward it. Okay, and then lastly, if I do have high skill, but the challenge is low, I'm going to be bored, right? I can sit out here and I can do this all day long and it's not, it's not that hard. It's not that, that interesting, right? So there has to be that match. We want flow. We need to match our skill with the level of challenge 
that is there. Get those to match just right and we're more likely to achieve that flow state. So some interesting nuances to this idea. Now, how do we achieve flow? So I've touched on this a little bit on some of the general things that are there within the characteristics, but, but how do we actually do it? Okay, and I'm just giving you general recommendations here. This isn't like, oh man, I guarantee you follow these steps and you're gonna achieve the flow and everything that it is you're, that you're doing. These are some general things to help kind of nudge you in that direction. So the first is, is pretty obvious, be positive mentally we go in and we have a sort of a negative mindset about whatever the situation performance situation is we're going into we're most likely not going to achieve a flow state to where doing what it is that we're doing is intrinsically rewarding just for the sake of doing it so we need to adopt a positive mindset well, thankfully that's a choice we have some control over that we also need to be positive emotionally Okay, so those thoughts can influence our emotions. So these, both of these things kind of feed into each other. Okay, how am I thinking about this situation will, will contribute to how I'm feeling about this situation. So I wanna be experiencing positive emotions, not sort of negative or what can be described as dysfunctional emotions. Okay, we can't be apathetic about what it is that we're doing. We need to have an optimal focus. So this is a mental skill. This is something that can be trained. You can practice this. I've had athletes before. I'm like, hey, I want you to really focus on just looking at this, this ball that you're holding in your hand, right? Look at that ball, ob uh, observe it, examine it, see how long you can keep your focus, right? And you give them, make them do it for a minute and it feels like it's forever. Like, ah, I stopped focusing on that and like two seconds in. Like there's something that can be developed. You're trying to, to, to learn how to focus on, on, so we're not, our attention isn't switching, isn't changing all the time, but so then we can have that sustained focus or that total concentration piece. So that's something that can be trained. We also need to be physically prepared. Okay, so if we go into a situation, a performance situation, and we're not in shape, we don't have the fitness that we need, the strength that we need to, to, uh, perform at the level that the, the challenge of the situation requires, we're not gonna achieve a flow state because there's gonna be something else that's distracting us that's a limiting factor. So I talk to athletes about that a lot of times, like what's the limiting factor here? What are the things that we have control over? We wanna eliminate limiting factors, as many of them as we possibly can. So then, so then we've done everything within our control and the only thing out there that can influence the outcome are things that are out of our control and we can be okay with that but if there's things that are within our control like being physically prepared we want to try and 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 work on that and then lastly we, we want to have a strong sense of cohesion if we're, if we're zooming out and looking at this perhaps on a team level with our with our teammates with our coaches we want to have some sort of bond there because otherwise those relational pieces can really get in the way of us focusing on what we need to focus on because maybe I'm bothered by something that my coach said or something that a teammate did or whatever and, and I don't have the cohesion to be able to take that in stride so I can maintain that focus. And then there's other things that are gonna draw us out of it of becoming one with what it is we're doing if we don't have those elements in place. So these are all some, like I said, some general tips that we can strive for to achieve flow maybe more regularly. Now I wanna talk about Yuri Hannon's individual zone of optimal functioning, right? Or the eyes off, okay? So basically we talk about peak performance, we talk about finding the zone, right? And, and we describe it as the zone as if there's just one zone. So this individual zone of optimal functioning idea is basically that everybody, every individual athlete, they have their own zone, right? I was in my zone would maybe be a better term for it. It's like, I mean, the zone, it was my zone. You have your zone, I have my zone to where I'm gonna perform at my absolute best. So we have different athletes. Athlete one may have a lower sort of uh, arousal or anxiety or activation level, right? They, they need to be more calm, more relaxed as they go in to, to their competition. 
their performance situation to perform at their best. You might athlete too, it might be somewhere in the middle of this spectrum, this range, right? Of sort of activation that they're experiencing or energization. And then athlete three might need to be going in where they're bouncing off the walls, right? They got head banging music going, they're bouncing up and down, right? And, and that's their zone to perform at their best. So every athlete needs to find out what their own zone is. So the application in this for coaches, is if you, you, you're gonna give a pep talk to your team and, and that's like one dimensional, right? You're gonna have all these athletes on your team and I'm gonna give this pep talk and, and I, I might have one athlete that they're really calm, they've maybe found their zone and I get them all pumped up and they overshoot their zone. Now they're out of that, right? And, and so I may need to tailor that somehow or, or have it be somewhere in the middle enough to where I don't get athletes to overshoot, but then I don't wanna have athletes who are underactivated. So some athletes might need more of that where you're pumping them up, getting them in their face, getting excited, slapping the top of their helmet, whatever, right? To help them find their zone. Coaches need to know what their athlete's zone is. And, and it's not necessarily gonna look like the coach's zone, it could be different. Okay, so that's the key. And, and this idea has kind of been expounded upon and, and been linked with different emotional patterns, right? So I alluded to this, some emotional patterns can be functional or they can be dysfunctional when it comes to performance. Okay, so you'd be dysfunctional or performance impairing if it's not the, the best emotion. So athletes often identify and they interpret their emotions differently so this, this, there's a range, right, that, that, that uh, we need to understand because that can help contribute or help us find the optimal zone, that individual zone. Okay, so these performance enhancing emotions, it might be, well, I'm feeling motivated or I'm feeling pumped, I'm amped, I'm charged, I'm, I'm feeling confident, right? So those would be positive emotion states or performance enhancing emotions. Whereas you could have it on the other end of the spectrum, were, uh, well, I guess we'll say negative emotions that may still be performance enhancing, okay? So you need to be confident, motivated, oh yeah, those are clearly gonna help performance, but you could be angry, you could be a little bit nervous even, and that could still enhance your performance. Maybe it's not gonna be to the same level, okay? But, but some athletes, when they get angry, they can actually elevate their performance. Some, it goes in the other direction. So that's, that's the idea here. Individual zone of optimal functioning. We need to learn to recognize those things. So other things that might be performance impairing emotions, well, I'm feeling kind of tired or depressed or I'm sad, right? There's negative things, or I'm just feeling, oh, I'm just, I don't know, I feel content, peaceful, I feel relaxed, right? It's like, well, you I mean, you want to feel relaxed, but you know, it's how we say that. It's just like, oh, I feel loose, I feel relaxed, I feel good, right? It's like, oh, I just feel kind of relaxed. I'm just kind of out of it. Not, like that's not gonna help performance. So we need to take all of those things in consideration when we're talking to athletes to figure out what was it like when you had your peak performance, right? Your best performance, where were you at? What were you experiencing? What was your activation level like? And then we try and, and, and emulate that in future performances to try and, and have a peak uh, a, again, which is something that we, we chase that seems to be elusive. So now I wanna to touch on something that is, again, this is what I mentioned at the beginning, is <clears throat> my sort of theory on this, this idea that this is untested, right? I'm just throwing it out there because I've thought about it and I think it's a fascinating, fascinating idea because there's the zone, there's the flow state, there's different expressions that people use out there and, and for me, I think about this in terms of like, man, why is it so elusive? Why is it that even when we have these these descriptors and maybe these little tips for how we can get in the zone more frequently, it's still just like really difficult for athletes to have that. They might have, you know, a few really just amazing performances in their entire career. I was like, what what happened? What how did the did the stars really align for them? And so my theory is that there's some sort of optimal frequency okay in 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 all of these different dimensions because obviously there's electromagnetic radiation there's different frequency wavelengths that are around us all the time constantly this is why people they they 
they use grounding, right? They want to dump off some electrons into the earth and all these, these different things that, that are, are fascinating that I don't even totally fully understand, right? Which as I say, it's an untested idea. It's just something that I've been speculating on and thinking about. And your, your, your heart rate, it's a rhythm. There's a frequency to it. Your microcirculation in your blood vessels operates on a frequency, right? And you have these little sort of micro pulses or, or micro contractions that you can affect with uh, um, electromagnetic fields, right? There's different technologies out there that you can use that, that uh, can enhance your microcirculation. And then you have your brain wavelengths. Well, is it, is it alpha? Is it beta? Is it theta? Like what's the optimal brain wavelength? And we've looked at that in terms of peak performance too. Where does our mindset need to be to, for optimal learning, optimal performance? And, and so my theory is that you have all of these different elements of frequency operating on an individual all the time, constantly. And so when we achieve a peak performance, I contend that there's got to be some sort of uh, uh, alignment of these frequencies. And maybe there's a way that we can achieve this more regularly. And, and maybe there's a way that um, we, can, we can work on different mental skills that can get us in the right mindset, that can enhance that. I don't know. It's just interesting to speculate uh, about because, well, all this stuff's around us all the time and peak, peak performance still eludes us. So what is it that's really going on here? I don't know, maybe there's something here. It's an interesting idea, but again, hasn't been tested. I'm not exactly sure how you would test it, but it's something that uh, maybe will come out in future research. So chew on that for a little bit as we move forward. Okay, so now let's look at some specific characteristics of top performance, right? We kind of got this background on peak performance in the zone and the flow. Maybe there's some even frequency out there that we can, we can optimize, I don't know, but what are the characteristics of top performers? We see these top performers, man, it seems like they find the zone more regularly than the rest of us. And maybe, maybe they do, maybe they don't, maybe they're just that much better, but there are some common characteristics that we observe in these performers that are worth noting. The first is they have an incredibly high level of confidence. They believe in themselves to get the job done and generally, they have a high level of what's called global confidence. So they just have a belief in themselves in, gen in, in, in general in anything. It's like I believe that if I'm not good at something yet, I could be good at it. I, the, the only reason I'm not good at it is because I haven't practiced it. Okay, so that's kind of the, the mindset there. So it's, it's never like, oh, I'm not good at it. So there's just global confidence. And then especially within their particular sport, they're super confident in, in their abilities, right? Their abilities to bounce back, their abilities to continue to persevere, to persist, even in the face of, of adversity. So high confidence, we definitely see that. We know it when we see it. That's there for sure. There's also this intense mastery focus. So those two different ideas of where we have a mastery orientation or an ego orientation, there's a really high, there may be some ego focus, for athletes where they do want to win, they're interested in the outcome, but they really want to master their craft, become as good as they possibly can become at it. And they're constantly finding ways to stretch themselves and challenge themselves and work just outside the limits of their current capabilities. And you do that long enough over the course of a career, you're going to continue to see improvement and just, just amazing what some of those top performers can do because of that. There's also incredible commitment and dedication. They have this willingness to sacrifice uh, other sort of instant gratification or other pleasurable activities that they can engage in in the moment because they're committed and they're dedicated to whatever goals they have set for themselves. So they don't, they don't uh, uh, waver on that at all. They don't, it's, you can't question their commitment because their actions actually show that they're committed. So a lot of lower level athletes, they'll give you some, some airway to their commitment. They'll say that they are committed, but then their actions don't necessarily match with it. Not so with top performance performers. Their actions show you where their commitment lies. 
They also have incredible attentional skills. And this is what I alluded to earlier is this can be developed. This can be practiced within sport, within context. <clears throat> I actually have talked about this many times in a, in a, a outdoor sport context is you see big game hunters across the uh, American continent, right? So it's a, a big pastime, right? Or, or a way of life for a lot of people, right? And, and to sit in a tree stand in the Midwest of the United States for hours without moving and intently focused on what it is that you're doing there when it's cold and you might be uncomfortable and all of that, that's an incredible ability to focus. And if you talk to these big game hunters, they'll tell you it's time flies. Like you can't believe it. They're so intently focused on what it is that they're doing and listening to every little sound and looking and, and sensing and, and feeling the wind, gauging the wind, assessing what's going on. Their attention is so high for that entire time that it, it's, it's like it's, it's a, a, a blip on the timeline. It goes by so fast because their attention is so great. So this is something that can really, really be developed over the course of time. They also have very well-developed coping abilities. Okay, so just for example, anxiety. Okay, everybody experiences anxiety to some degree, some of us more than others. And our ability to cope with anxiety is a key distinguishing factor. So top performers, they interpret anxiety as a beneficial thing. They don't interpret it as a negative thing. That's a key, key thing to understand here. It's like, okay, yeah, you mean you experience anxiety too? Really? Like you get stressed? Oh yeah. It's just like, that's normal. Like that's your body telling you it's getting ready to perform. And so that by itself, just how they interpret that is a powerful coping mechanism and, and something that, that could be emulated for sure. There's also this relentless positive attitude. I like that term. It's relentless, relentless, even when it's challenging, even when it's challenged. If, if they're facing adversity and there's things that I could have every reason to be negative, they're still positive. They're relentless with that. And, and again, that's something that's a choice. They have, a, they have really high standards for themselves in, in just how they are and how they live. It's not necessarily just in their sport. Although some athletes do tend to compartmentalize, like within their sport, man, standards are really high. Outside of that, maybe they're a little bit more relaxed, okay? But they to hold themselves to a really high standard where sometimes low level performers might feel uncomfortable. It's like, why are you being so hard on yourself? Like, well, that's part of the reason why they're so good at what it is they do. It's because they hold themselves to a high standard. Okay, they also implement really good uh, strategy for mental skill development. So they have the use imagery, they have pre-competition and competition plans, recovery plan, mental recovery plans if they have a lapse. So they strategize everything. Basically, they've seen every possible scenario that might unfold in their mind before it could ever happen. They've strategized how they're gonna respond to it so they don't go out there in a situation and get surprised by what it is that's happening. Okay, they use really they use strategy to their to their advantage. And then lastly, we could spend a lot of time talking about mental toughness by itself, but they are very mentally tough people. They really have this strong belief in their ability to achieve whatever their goals are despite the challenges of or adversity that may impair them or get in their way. So they have that belief along with this really strong focus on their long-term goals over whatever sort of other life goals that they, that they may have out there. So it's that combination is what mental toughness is, right? Their belief in their ability to still achieve their goals it, it, despite the adversity and the challenges that can get in the way and then that incredible focus on those long-term goals, okay? So they don't have, let these little things along the way get in there, get or disrupt them or derail them because they have the big picture in mind. So these, this, this is a great list of items to consider for this, characteristics of top performers that I think that we should all be striving for in more than just sport, but life in general. Okay, so let's, let's 
delve into a few of these pro tips, right? How to promote peak performance. This is like the moment everybody's been waiting for. How do we actually do that? Well, the first step is awareness. Any conversation you're going to hear in the sports psych world, awareness is always going to be step one. Okay. And what I'm talking about here is how do we raise our awareness for our levels of activation, arousal, energy? Like, are we paying attention to that? Do we know where we are? Where was it when we were at a peak versus when we were at a, a low level performance? What sort of emotions are we experiencing bringing into the competition with us, bringing into practice with us, whatever? What are we telling ourselves? What are our thoughts? Self-talk, different things. Concentration, are we focusing on the right things? And so we have that awareness, but then we also need the ability to adjust those things according to what the context is, okay? So awareness, it's a skill that must be learned. We have to develop this. It's essential. It's really, really important that we pay attention and know what's going on. So a lot of athletes, they'll miss things because they're obsessed with the outcome or they're paying attention to the wrong thing. So I, I once coached a college tennis player who came and sat down next to me at the changeover. And I was asking him, I said, so you can you see what your opponent's strategy is? Can you see what's going on? Like, can you, can you do, are you paying attention? Because I was watching, it didn't really seem like that. It wasn't making any adjustments. He's like, oh, I don't know what he's doing. I'm like, well, I'd like, but you like, you appear focused, yet you're missing these things. So you are focused, but not on the right things. So sometimes like you got to zoom back out and have that awareness. Am I paying attention to what's going on? Am I missing anything? What's happening here? He was completely missing the strategy. And so we made some adjustments and ended up performing a lot better in that match. Okay. So sometimes great coaching can, can help. So uh, the, to take this a little bit further though, right? If you want to break this down, awareness piece, athletes first need to become aware of what their, per, their ideal performance state is. Okay. So this is a related to the, the individual zones of optimal functioning or the flow state or the frequency idea, right? So what are the things that lead to that state? What did I do in the past? This is actually where a lot of superstitions come from in sport. Like I always put my socks on the same way. I always fold my clothes and put them in my bag the same way. I always listen to the same playlist before a competition, right? Athletes get superstitious. They're like, well, that was, those are the things that happened that led to that one performance. So I'm going to do that again. Okay. And, and that can, that can be okay. Right. But then along this, with that, athletes need to recognize when they fall out of that state, okay? And then they need to have a plan to get back into that state. So there's a lot of different techniques out there for that, but, th but that's part of the awareness. So Ken Revisa, really, really famous sports psych, uh, sports psych consultant, worked with Major League Baseball, was really big on baseball, but lots of other athletes. So he developed the, the, the R's for this, right? The system of the R's. So responsibility. Uh, uh, accepting that responsibility for what it is that's happening, what's going on, occurring, right? And instead of laying blame on anybody else, recognizing what's happening, being willing to release things that happened in the past so we're not hanging on to them, right? And I've heard the story he had in the, in the dugout in baseball games, an athlete have a crummy play and they come down and they, they had a, they put a toilet in the dugout. Like you flush that last play down the toilet. You got to release it. Okay, then we got to regroup. Okay, regroup on what it is that we're going to do, collect ourselves, refocus in, be re ready ourselves to go back in and then respond to the situation. Okay, so the uh, this R is a responsibility, accept responsibility, recognize what's going on, release the last thing, regroup, refocus, ready yourself and respond to get back in the situation. Okay, so that's one model. There's lots of different ways that, that, that you could do that, but that's part of awareness. Okay, that's part of awareness. Really, really important is the first step. We also need to build cohesion. If we don't get along, we don't work well, and we're in a team sport, that's not going to go over too well in terms of peak performance. So we need to build that. The team building activities are all about that. Get to know your teammates, but also know how they play. Know how they play the game and how they perform and how that complements, complements the way you play the game. So really great examples out there abound on this where teammates they just like they just knew what the other one was going to do they were so cohesive in terms of the task that was going on and that can be built that can be developed 
by playing together, but also paying attention to what your teammates are doing. I think when I was a college basketball player, I remember learning the offense. Like we had this new offense and these plays that were introduced. And I was so focused on learning my role that then we go out and play. And then sometimes you'd get disjointed and you switch position with someone else. And I didn't know how to run the offense from their position. That's not very cohesive. You need to know how every other person on the team, what it is they're doing and how you fit within that. That's uh, the type of task cohesion I'm talking about. We also need good leadership, good coaching. I touched on that already. That can be really helpful. Raising awareness, building the cohesion, having that, that feedback that's really effective feedback to help direct our attention to where it needs to be or help us regroup, release, all the things in, in uh, uh, Revisa's R's uh, model can be useful. We also need to have clear plans. So you have mental prep plans, pre-competition, competition plans, you have mental recovery plans, and, and all of those things need to be in place so we can respond and have that peak performance instead of have it derailed. Because that's what you see a lot of times athletes, they can go out there and like things can be going well, and then just once the, the walls came crashing down, there was no building that back up in that competition. That's always really hard to see because there wasn't a plan for that. So we need to have a plan for every possible situation. And then we need emotional and social support. This can come from our coaches. It can come from teammates. It can come from family outside, but we have to have that backing. If we go into a situation, we don't feel like there's that backing, that can be really hard. There's some, some uh, interesting examples out there on that too. Pete Sampras was playing Jim Courier in this, in this match. There's some great videos online. He was, he, Someone that was close to Pete was going through something really hard and uh, he was struggling out on court and Jim Courier said t something to him. You have to look it up. It's an interesting video uh, uh, that illustrates this. Like it can be hard and it can affect your performance if you don't feel that emotional and social support or other things go are going on. And then lastly, we need to engage in mental skills training. If we believe that mental skills can be trained just like physical skills, we should devote significant amount of time to training them, okay? And, and most athletes, just lay athletes, amateur athletes, don't really spend a lot of time doing that. Top level athletes do, peak performers do. So there's a few tips, not exhaustive, but a few tips to promote peak performance for you in the future. So in review, we've covered a lot. We talked about different descriptors of peak performance, what that's like, being unconscious, the time distortion, right? The paradox of control. Some of that lines up with flow and how we achieve our flow state. We hit on the individual zone of optimal functioning or the eyes off, I touched on, introduced the frequency to you, never before been released to the world. Uh, Dr. Colin Fair's idea on peak performance and how the frequencies align somehow with our brain and microcirculation and, and electromagnetic magnetic radiation, all those things come together, the untested hypothesis. Uh, we touched on characteristics of performers and offered some pro tips for you to achieve peak performance, mental skills training be one of, being one of the most important. So with that, that is this uh, lecture in the Sports Psych Concepts lecture series. Hopefully you benefited from it. Look forward to more content coming your way. Uh, best of luck to you in your studies of Sports Psych, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this recording in the Sports Psych lecture series. I hope you learned something. More importantly, I hope you learned something that you can apply in your life. Feel free to share this presentation with others who might be interested. And if you're interested in more content like this, visit the Fair Advantage channel on YouTube or find the Fair Advantage podcast on Spotify or visit my website at fairadvantage.com.